Welcome to the Plato Paradigm, a paradigm shift in reading Plato's dialogues. Episode 158, Mino Conclusions. Last time we looked at the first half of the dialogue, Mino, and we saw that the arguments are non-existent, they're not worthy of the name argument, not in a philosophical sense. There are lots of sophisms, spurious arguments, and the only consistent thing we found was that Socrates is trying all the time to make Mino react and to begin to think critically. This would suggest that there is yet another consistent thing in the dialogue, and that is that Mino never thinks critically. The rambling nature of the dialogue is exacerbated in the second half of the dialogue by the appearance and then disappearance of, first of all, the slave of Mino, and then the xenos of Mino, Anitos, the host of Mino in Athens. The slave of Mino is introduced in order to demonstrate the truth of the account by the priests and priestesses, not the theory of recollection, but what the priests and priestesses have claimed, which is that someone who knows nothing can acquire knowledge from the soul without outside intervention, without being taught. This is what Socrates tries to demonstrate to Mino. This is what he claims that he's trying to demonstrate to Mino. But we can see that Socrates is teaching. What's the problem? Mino has a particular idea of teaching. For Mino, teaching is being told things. When Gorgias teaches his students, the result would be the sort of answers which Mino has given towards the beginning of the dialogue, the answers he heard from Gorgias. These are effectively opinions of Gorgias, which Mino is treating as knowledge, episteme. Socrates doesn't do that with the slave. Mino, who has been told to listen carefully to what Socrates says to the slave, doesn't hear Socrates tell the slave anything. In fact, what happens is that Socrates shows the slave by drawing lines in the sand, and then he asks questions about the shapes that he has drawn. The only time he actually tells the slave anything is when he gives him the name of the diagonal line. Given that Mino is convinced by this performance that the soul knows everything the human doesn't, but the human can learn from looking into the soul, we would have thought that Mino would then continue with this idea to the end of the dialogue, that if we want to understand anything, we should look inside. But he never does that. He always returns to the idea of teaching in the sophistic manner. This point is emphasized by Plato, the dramatist, who has... Socrates talk about teaching until the end of the dialogue, in which Socrates draws the ramifications of not being able to teach virtue. This whole movement begins when Mino yet again balks at having to answer the question, what is virtue? And he instead returns to his original question, asking what sort of thing virtue is, rather than what virtue is. And although Socrates protests that we cannot know what sort of thing virtue is before we know what it is, 
which is false, Socrates suggests a hypothesis that if virtue is something teachable, then it must be a form of episteme, because only episteme is what is taught. Now, we already know that this is wrong, because we have seen for ourselves that Socrates doesn't teach episteme when he taught the slave. He asked questions and tried to get the slave to understand. But Mino has already forgotten about the demonstration and has reverted to his idea that teaching is about passing along episteme from teacher to student. Significantly, the option that virtue is something exercisable is forgotten, completely dropped, while the option that virtue comes to people by nature is dismissed with a very sophistic argument. Socrates has thus set up the rest of the dialogue to be devoted to the subject of teaching, and in particular teaching arete, virtue. Anitus is introduced, in effect, to present a different way of transmitting virtue from an authority to a student, but he is opposed to the sophists. We may suspect that this in itself is a dialectical move to create tension in Mino, that he either has to accept that sophists are wrong or that Anitus is wrong. In fact, there is no tension because Mino can live with inconsistencies. Socrates doesn't so much refute Anitus as reveal that Anitus agrees with him that politike arite is something which exists, but it's not something which can be taught, because otherwise the sons of great politicians would have been great politicians themselves, but even Anitus has to agree that they are not. As usual, this is not a philosophical argument. We haven't even decided what politike arite is, what what political virtue is, what it is to be a good politikos, and we are effectively judging people without the criterion. After Anitos is gone, Socrates and Mino agree, therefore, that politike arete is not teachable because neither politikoi nor sophists seem to be able to teach other people. This again is refuted in a non-philosophical way. It is observed that sophists don't agree over the possibility of teaching politike arete, but this is insufficient to prove that politike arete cannot be taught at all. And indeed, some of those sophists who are argued against may actually be able to teach politica arete. I'm not saying they do, but the philosophical argument would not rest simply on a dispute between sophists. Having manipulated Mino into accepting that Politica arete is not episteme, because had it been episteme, it could be taught. Socrates introduces the notion that politica arete has to do with doxa, opinion. Mino agrees to this because there are definitely good politikoi, in other words, there are people who have politike arete, but they demonstrably cannot teach their sons, therefore they don't have episteme about politike arete, that is, politike arete is not a sort of episteme, because they cannot teach it, and it is, for me, no, only episteme that can be taught, therefore what they have is a form of doxa, which, for me, no, is something which cannot be taught because it isn't episteme. 
And because politicarité is a good thing, the doxa has to be good as well. Therefore, Socrates calls it orthodoxa, correct opinion, or aletheis doxa, true opinion, and he even proves that people have this good doxa by the analogy with leading an army to Larissa. People who can get to Larissa must have had the right opinion, even if they had not known where Larissa was. The fact that they arrive at Larissa means that they had a good opinion. The problem with this argument, of course, is that you cannot know that the opinion is correct or true until after the event. If someone has a doxa about where Larissa is and ends up in another place entirely, we shouldn't be surprised because the doxa doesn't lead. The rest of the dialogue might look as though Socrates is trying to prove how good correct opinion is, but if you look at it closely, it's clear that he is trying to make Mino react against the idea, because Socrates emphasizes how unintelligent these politicians are. They are occupied by God. They have no nous intellect of their own. And if there's one thing we should recall, recollect from the beginning of the dialogue, it is that someone appears to be good if he knows. This is why Gorgias spends so much time teaching people to answer any question at all as befits someone who knows. In other words, they don't actually know, but they appear to know, and that's good enough. If you want to appear to be good, just learn how to answer questions. Socrates has here set up an internal inconsistency for Mino. The politicians are good because they have opinion but not episteme and this should cause some discomfort to Mino. How can they appear to be good while they also appear to be bad? As usual however Mino can live with inconsistencies. This is consistent in Mino. In any case Mino is delighted by Socrates' gift to him of a fourth option, that virtue comes to people by divine portion, Thea Moira. The dialogue ends as badly as it began. Where is the philosophy?